All right, let's open our time together in prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this time, for this opportunity, Lord, just to come together, to love each other, and Lord, just be part of worshiping you. In your name we pray, amen. So this first song that we are going to sing today is, we haven't sang for a little bit, it was actually requested by Jessica, and so that's just a good reminder, a little plug for everyone. If there is a song that you would like to hear, let me know, and if you let me know, I'll try and get it up for Sunday. All right, now we can get started. Oh, 
today, but, you know, an old favorite that most people know.
verse 1. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt and their ways are vile. There is no one who does good. God looks down from heaven on the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. Everyone is turned away. They have, get, they have together become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. While evil, evildoers never will, evildoers never learn. Those who devour my peoples as men eat meat, and who do not call on God. There they were, overwhelmed with dread, where they, sorry, where there was nothing to dread. God scattered the bones of those who attacked you. You put them to shame, for God despised them. Oh, that the salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When God restores the fortune of his people, let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. And that was Psalm 53.
message. Heavenly <coughs> Father, Lord, I just thank you for this opportunity we have just to come together, Lord, to worship you through prayer, through song, through reading of your word. And now, Lord, for the message. Lord, open our hearts, open our minds. Lord, be with my tongue. In your name we pray. Amen. So I'm going to share two stories today. But they're stories that I've shared before, but with a little bit of a twist on them and for a different reason. The first story happened while we were in Bible school. In our third and fourth year while we were at Bible school, we were full-time married students. That meant, obviously, we were married, but both of us were students at the same time, which meant, because a lot of students, when they go to school, one, or sorry, a lot of students, when a lot of married couples go to school, one will work and one will be a student so that they have some kind of income. We didn't do that. We just went straight uh, students the whole time. So this meant, though, that at times, or sorry, I should back up. This meant when, at, when we were at school, at that time, PRBI did not have housing for married students. They do now, but at that time they did. So that meant we had to buy a place, we had to buy a trailer off of another married student who had graduated the year before, and we still lived on campus, but we had our own home there. So, that was great. But being full-time, newlywed, Bible school students, that meant we didn't have a lot of money. Like most students, you have a lot of money, but when you have the additional expenses of, you know, the loan we had to pay off for, well, it was a line of credit we had to pay off, all those different things we had to do, we lived on a very tight shoestring budget. There were months that the only thing we had to live off of was our family allowance check that we got because of Sierra, which with one child isn't that much, and the kindness and generosity of the school and some people that supported us. You know, I would get leftovers from the kitchen at school so we could be able to, be able to eat some nights. Well, we ate every night. What I'm saying is sometimes the school would give us food so that we actually could eat as well. Um, like I said, things were really tight for us, but we made it through. But there was one month, you know, because we had our bills to pay and we had to buy food and everything else. There was one month, though, that we had the electric bill. And the bill was $70, but we had literally zero money. And the bill was due the next day, and I was really distraught. You can almost say I was upset because I was someone who always paid my bill. It was a matter of pride for me to be able to do that. That's how I was raised, and that's what you did. So not to be able to pay a bill was really distressing for me. We spent a lot of time praying about it, but you know what? There was just nothing we could do. There was, yeah, there was no way we could get that money that we needed, and I wasn't going to go and ask and borrow or beg off of anyone else. We just didn't know what to do. So it was lunchtime. We had talked about it. We had prayed about it, and I went back to class. When I came home from class, Naomi was, I think she even met me at the door. She was absolutely excited. And I had gone to class and, you know, hadn't really enjoyed the class, got much, hadn't got much out of it because I was still upset about not being able to pay this bill. Well, I walk in and Naomi then tells me what happened while I was gone. While I was gone, the Mr. T, Mr. T is a wonderful uh, elderly gentleman that was at the school. He was one of the maintenance guys. He was walking past our trailer and... He went and knocked on the door, and Naomi opened the door while I was gone, because he was a maintenance guy. He was coming in and out of trailers all the time and doing that kind of stuff. And he says, I don't know why, but God wants me to give you this, and gave her money, and then just turned around and walked away. And it was the $70 that we needed for our bill. I think the bill might have been like $74, but we could, we could come up with those last four bucks ourselves. That was absolutely incredible that God had provided through Mr. T in that way. Mr. T didn't know anything about our finances. He didn't know that we had this bill. He didn't know that we didn't have any money. He just knew that God wanted him to do that. Now, fast forward a few months. It may have even been the next school year. I was with Mr. T, and I still remember this. We were in the gym, and we were talking, and he was just, he started telling me this story. From his perspective because he didn't know when he did when he gave us that money he didn't know it was me he knew me but he didn't really know Naomi very well he just thought oh, to show it up and give someone some money and I didn't think about it so he's telling me the story and I stop him like Mr. T that was me you gave me the money and he's like oh 
And I'm like, and you don't know why? And he's like, no, I don't know why. I'm like, that's because that very next day, we had a bill due that we could not pay. And that was the money that we needed to be able to pay that bill. So his faith was strengthened because now he knew why God. He had gone, you know, six months, a year, maybe more than that, not knowing why God told him to do that and what happened with it. Now I was able to tell him. So now I was encouraged by this. He was even more encouraged because he saw, you know, as Paul Harvey says, the rest of the story. That's what he saw. Now, I'm going to jump to the second story. The second story happened also while we were at Bible school. But at least the first half of the story does. So we were at Bible school, and Naomi's family lived about an hour away. So a lot of times we would spend weekends up there because Naomi would still try to do some work up there, work in the pig barn where she'd worked during the summer with her families. And sometimes it was just to get away from school and to be somewhere else. You eat a home-cooked meal and that kind of idea. Well, while we would go back to her parents' place, we would also go to her parents' church. While we were at the church, we, of course, built relationships with everyone in the church because it was a great church. And there was one couple in particular, the Parleys. They were a wonderful, well, they are, because they're both still alive. They are a wonderful, godly couple. Well, one time, I remember talking to them. And, I mean, because I, I talked to them quite often. And they told me a story. And I don't remember how this story came up and whatnot, but they told me a story that they had friends that they would visit. And the friends lived a little ways away, and they would go up every weekend or every other weekend and go to their house and just play cards with them all night. The Parleys are great godly people, and I mean, their faith drives their life. Their friends that they were visiting were not Christians. So the Parleys developed this friendship, kept it going for a long time, and they would come home every time and like, just, they would always beat themselves up in the car. They're like, oh, you know, we didn't share the gospel with them. We didn't. Didn't tell them about her faith or nothing like that. And they would just, every week, they would kind of beat themselves up about it. But they would never share them. They didn't know why. Well, eventually, these, this couple that they visited did become Christians. Partly because, or even a major reason, because of the Parley's presence, right? Because the Parley's never shared the gospel and didn't say, you need Jesus. You know, you're a sinner and you need to repent. But they were just there, loving them, being part of their life, showing kindness to them. That was one of the things that brought them to the Lord. That's a great story. I love that story. And I remember that story because it shows the importance of relationship with people. It's not always the words we say. It's how we live our life. How we love people that changes them. So that's, that's a story. And I love that story. And I always rem remember me. Now, fast forward to the time when we moved here in Rich Valley. And I want to say it was in the first six months we were here. But I could be a little off on that. We had... A missionary guest here. I don't remember their names anymore. I can still see their faces. They had an orphanage in Kenya. Do you remember their names, John and Kathy? Or Alfreda? What was their names? I think Larry. Yeah, Larry and Kathy. Hopkins. Yeah, it's, I'm sure it starts with an H too, but it, it doesn't matter. But you know who I'm talking about, right? They, they were here, they, they shared about their, their ministry, the orphanage they ran in Kenya, it was really neat. And then afterwards, I don't know how it came up, but I ended up sharing this story about the Parleys with them, you know, and the Parleys and their friends. And Larry, back then, he's like, whoa, that was us. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, we were the couple that the Parleys visited. I'm like, wow, I get to meet this couple that I told, I told other people about the story. I'm like, now I finally get to meet them. That's so cool. That's so exciting. And then Larry told me also, as Carl Harvey says, the rest of the story. Larry said, oh, yeah. And I, because I said, oh, yeah, because the Parley said, because they were Christians and whatnot by this point in time. I was like, oh, yeah, the Parley's always just beat themselves up because they never shared the gospel with you and this. And he says, yeah. And he says, and if they ever would have shared the gospel with us, we would have kicked them out. We would have never had them back. But because they were there all the time, building a relationship with us, loving us, showing what Christians look like, but not preaching anything without us, not shoving anything down our throat, that's why we became Christians. And later on became missionaries in the Rift Valley in um, Kenya. And I was like, that's absolutely incredible to hear the other side of the story, to meet the person from the story, your faith increases. And then, I don't remember how long after that, I went back because at that time we went quite often up north to see Naomi's family. 
I went and told the parlays, well, you want to talk about their faith being increased as well. And then hearing that other side, it also relieved their conscience. Because then they found out, oh, all this time we were beating ourselves up about not sharing the gospel. If we would have done that, that would have ruined that friendship. They're like, oh, we feel so much better. <laughs> yeah, you can say that in a way. <clears throat> you know, those are two stories, very prominent stories that I can remember this week. But you know, that's happened several times where people, and you know, maybe you've experienced this, when you're telling a story about something cool or amazing or that God has done, or just even a funny story from life, and someone will pop up and say, oh yeah, I was there, or that was me. And I mean, how neat that is when that happens, especially in a spiritual context, how that increases your faith to see how God works through people. It's absolutely amazing to see. You know, you see, when you talk to the person, like, oh yeah, that was me. I was blessed by that. Oh, that's cool. And then they can tell you your side of it. Or if it's the person who did the blessing, the person who helped out, now they know why. Oh, that's why God wanted me to do that thing that I didn't understand at that time. And this is what happened because of it. That's absolutely amazing. You know, that one little thing I did made a huge difference. In our Bible passage today, we actually have a very similar story. A very similar thing happens. Our passage today is 2 Kings chapter 8, verses 1 to 6. Now that's a short passage, and usually when we've been going through 1 Kings, I just sum up the story. I may embellish the story. I may make it exciting and whatnot because they're longer stories. Today, though, I'm just going to read straight from the passage because I don't think it also needs any embellishment or any uh, summarizing as well. 2 Kings. 2 Kings. Chapter 8, verses 1 to 6. Thank you. Yeah. So, 2 Kings, chapter 8, verses 1 to 6. Now, Elisha had said to the woman whose son had re he had restored to life, Go away with your family and stay for a while wherever you can, because the Lord has decreed a famine in the land that will last seven years. The woman proceeded to do as the man of God said. She and her family went away and stayed in the land of the Philistines seven years. At the end of the seven years, she came back from the land of the Philistines and went to the king to beg for her house and her land. The king was talking to Gehazi, the servant of the man of God, and had said, Tell me all about the great things Elijah has done. Just as Gehazi was telling the king, how Elijah had restored the dead to life, the woman whose son Elijah had brought back to life came to beg the king for her house and land. Gehazi said, This is the woman, my lord, the king, and this is her son who Elijah restored to life. The king asked the woman about it, and she told him. And he assigned an official to her case and said to him, Give back everything that belonged to her, including all the income from her land from the day that she left the country until now. Can you imagine being in that room? Can you imagine being one of those people? There are three different people in this in the story. I mean, of course, there was more people who heard and were amazed by this. But can you imagine being that poor sh sh uh, sh Shunammite woman who... You know, she had gone and followed God's word and went and lived in Philistine territory because a, a drought was coming, uh, a time of famine. And then she comes back and what does she find? Someone else has moved into her property, moved into her land. The king, the king may have even confiscated it at that time. She's come back and found absolutely nothing. And if we remember also, this woman was pretty well to do. She had a big house, lots of land, lots of things going on, and she's lost it all. So she comes back to the king to beg the king to get her to get her stuff back, you know, to him to reverse this decision or make the people who took it to, to return it to her. And what does she walk into? She walks into someone telling her story. Her story about how God gave her a son and then how God raised that son back up to life when that son had died. I mean, could you imagine hearing that as you walk in? You're expecting to come to throw yourself at the king and to beg and to do all this stuff, and then you walk in and you hear your story being told. Or can you imagine being the king? 
hearing this absolutely mind-blowing story that just seems beyond belief, and then to have the person, the very person who it's about to walk in be like, yeah, basically, here's the living proof of what you just heard, right? You may not believe it, but this is what happened. Once again, just absolutely incredible. I think this also shows God's sense of timing, and also, I want to say a little bit, God's humor, right? I mean, this is just, it's an amazing situation, but I think it's also a very funny situation as well. The comedic timing on this is great. Or can you imagine being Gehazi, the servant, who has just told the king what God has done. He has just told the king about a miracle, and then literally that miracle walks in. You know, that boy walks in and be like, oh my, like, he probably his jaw dropped. His jaw hit the floor, he probably, uh, uh, well, there's the person I'm just talking about, right? And like I said, never mind everyone else who is in this room, is in the throne room, listening to the story that is beyond belief, and then see the walking proof walk in on them it is absolutely amazing. And because of God's providential timing in this, this is the other thing we want to underscore a little bit in here too, right? This woman was coming in, she was expecting to beg to get her stuff back, right? and expecting probably a long, drawn-out legal trial or just to be turned away by the king because it was quite possible it was the king who confiscated the land when she left. And here she walks in, and not only does the king say, oh yeah, you can have it all back, no problem, but on top of that, you can have all the income that your land made while you're away. That's incredible. I mean, the king not only showed justice by saying, yes, you can have back what was rightfully yours. He also showed generosity to her because she was allowed to get all the money that it had earned. And chances are the king paid all that money out of his own coffers to this woman. That's how impressed he was by this story. And you have to remember, this is in Israel, in, northern, in the northern kingdom. Were there any godly kings in Israel? No, there were no godly kings. Some of these kings were quite bad kings. You know, hey, I want that. They would get that person killed just so they could have that piece of land. We know the story of Naboth. And yet here we see because of this story, because of this living proof, because of what God has done, he not only saw justice served, he saw he became very generous because of it. This is a very short story. This is one of the smallest stories that we've looked at in First and Second Kings. This is also a different story because there's no big grandiose miracle. There's no battles. There's no sermons or anything like that in here. This one is very different from everything else we learned. But yet in here, we see a very important lesson. A lesson for everyday life. As with the two stories that I shared at the beginning of this message, the point here is to share your stories. Because that's what Gehazi was doing. He was just sharing the stories that he had lived. And he was sharing them with the king. It is so important to share your stories. Share about all the things that God has done for you. You know, we talked about a little bit at Sunday school this morning. When I was at conference in Texas two weeks ago. We had very long days. And then in the evenings we would relax. And we'd kind of blow off steam. And, you know, we'd, we would tell funny stories. We would tell jokes and whatnot, but we'd also tell the stories about what God had done in our lives and how that would encourage us and how that bolstered our faith in our God and how we rejoiced in what God was doing in our lives and in the lives of our friends that we had just met or people that we didn't even really know and the things that happened in their life and how that built relationships between us and increased our faith. Sharing how what God has done encourages not only you but encourages the people you listen to and if you happen to be in one of those times like in our story today or like the, the two stories i shared where in that story where someone pops up and says oh that was me that was in that story how much more does that increase your faith how much more do you learn from that and appreciate from that the other reason it's important to tell our stories to think of these stories is not only just to encourage each other in, in times like this or when we're just sitting around and enjoying each other's company. It's important to remember these stories, and we've talked about this a few times, that when you are going through hard times in life, when you are going through difficult situations, 
and you don't know where to go, and you don't know what to do, and you may even feel hopeless in those times, remember the stories of your life. Remember the stories of the lives other people have told you. Because when you remember your stories and the stories of other people, you'll say, hey, I may not know how I'm going to get out of this situation. I may not know what to do in this situation. I may see no hope in this situation, but God has helped me out of similar situations, worse situations, or they've helped other people I know through their situations. And when we look at those stories, we say, yes, I can get through this because of what God has done. And I think that's really important. Like I said, when I first talked about this little part here, there's no big grandiose miracles. There's no big battles or anything like this. This is, well, this isn't quite average everyday life stuff with people being raised back from the dead. But the stories I shared really are just everyday life, right? We all struggle with bills. We all have friends that we go and visit and whatnot. It's important to share those stories, right? Because it's one thing for a person to come and say, oh, this big big amazing thing happened, we saw miracles and we saw all this kind of stuff. And people go, oh, that's amazing, that's, that's great to hear those big amazing and miracle stories. But I think it's just as important or even more important to hear the little stories. The little stories from people like you, like me. Because when we hear those little stories, we relate to them, we understand them, we see how they can be applied to our lives. But when we hear those big stories, we think, oh, wow, that's great, but that's never going to happen to me. That can never happen to my situation. I'm not that special person. I'm not that amazing speaker or that amazing missionary or that amazing whatever they are. But when someone like you tells a story how God has provided in their life, you can relate to that story because that person is just like you. God works. Yes, he does big, amazing, miraculous stories, but he also does the little stories. The little stories of encouragement. The little stories of guys knocking on your door and saying, here, have some, here, have this little bit of money. Or a person coming along and just saying, hey, how are you doing today? Have a cup of coffee. Right? We all have the stories that we can share of the little encouragements in life because we need those. We need those to get through our lives every day because we all face situations. Remember what God has done in your life and in the lives of others and share your stories to encourage other people. And the other really neat thing is when you encourage other people by telling your stories, you're encouraging yourself because what are you doing? You're remembering what God has done and you won't forget those stories if you are telling them. Yeah, so whether they're big, whether they're small, whether they're amazing, whether they're mundane, whether they're ordinary, still tell them, still remember them to encourage other people, and to help yourself. With that, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you, Lord, for this small little story that we can look at. But Lord, how it shows the importance of us telling stories in our lives of how you are in our lives, in big ways and small ways, Lord, that we can encourage ourselves and each other, Lord, and how you work in our lives, Lord. And let us never forget that. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, so we'll have our closing song now.
end our service. So thank you all very much for coming. Thank you very much for watching. And let's just close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this opportunity just to come together, Lord. Lord, I pray that you'll be with each and every one of us, Lord, as we go out today. Lord, we do the things that you have planned for us, Lord. And Lord, till we come together again next week, or we see each other in eternity. In your name we pray. Amen. So thank you for coming, and have a great day.